So I'd like to welcome Rushan Liu. Uh, Rushan is a PhD candidate in electrical engineering working with Professor James Zhou and works on reinforcement learning and real world data for clinical trials. So hello everyone. Uh, I'm Rui Shan from James Zhou's lab. Uh, today I'm going to present our project about real world data for clinical trial optimization. So this is a collaboration with Genotech. So uh, before I go into what is optimization for clinical trial, I'll first give like a short overview about clinical trials and the related information. So I think like most people are quite familiar with uh, the pro process of the clinical trials. So basically, uh, at each phase, uh, we all select a cohort of patients and do certain studies. So uh, uh, from that streamline, uh, we'll try to understand the risk and benefits of a treatment of this specific population. And we hope to facilitate ability to apply the findings to all the patients uh, in the real world. However, there is a problem, which is the clinical trial enrollment is always pretty low. So what does this mean? So there once have a survey uh, for the cancer patients uh, where like people find uh, around 75% uh, of people, they are willing to participate in the clinical trial. But in reality, uh, there, there are also statistics um, saying that only around 8% of adults US cancer patients uh, can participate in those clinical trials. So um, here is uh, the graph basically showing like most patients are not eligible for the clinical trials because for those clinical trials, people generally have pretty strict um, criteria for enrollments. So then, uh, like it's pretty straightforward. The eligibility is a barrier to the trial enrollments. So usually, what we what we have is very strict eligibility. So, uh, for example, here are some facts we list here. Um, like, for example, only 40%, like there are 40% trials failed to reach the minimum enrollment. So those trials, they didn't enroll enough patients, so they are not eligible. And also, we know like if uh, the trials are slow, that also delays uh, the useful results, delays uh, the drug approval. And also, um, if we have like the strict eligibility or strict selection rule, uh, the cohorts uh, selected may not reflect uh, the demographics or the performance of all the patients, like uh, all the real world population. So then there comes an, a natural idea, say, can we relax the inclusion exclusion criteria or can we broaden the eligibility for clinical trials? Uh, that is to say, can we just enroll more patients? Or we can, can we just relax uh, or ignore some rules people used to use? So that we know if we can broaden the eligibility, uh, we can increase the number of patients so that we can also accelerate the research. And also, that's also the best interest for the patients. So that is uh, the main uh, project, uh, that also the main uh, topic of our research, which is we try to analyze can we relax the inclusion exclusion criteria without compromising the treatment effects. So uh, our work, the pipeline basically is we simulate the clinical trials from the real world data um, and then we streamline the cohort selection process and lastly, we, then we are able to analyze the influence of inclusion cr exclusion criteria and also to uh, study the possibility to relax them. Um, so first uh, is a short overview of our data. So this is a collaboration with Genotech uh, where we get a very good flatterum cancer data set. Uh, so for now, uh, in the presentation, we most focus at the non-small cell lung cancer. And the data, we have like a very, um, we have like fresh data and 
uh, for example, the line of therapy. So uh, on each line, what patients, the drug patients get uh, and stuff, and the demographics of patients, and also the administration records. And we also have the lab test results. So, um, so that we have actually we get uh, like most information we need for all the patients and all the records. So that then we can use the real world data to simulate the clinical trials. By simulate, we mean, for example, given you a uh, clinical trial and you want to analyze the uh, performance of certain drug, and then we just look at the patients and the records who just taken that specific drug. So, so that you have a cohort of patients who taken this drug, and we just use them to analyze the effectiveness of the drug. And our second step is to streamline the cohort selection process. So in general, for uh, each clinical trials, we usually have 20 rules, around 20 rules. Um, so they, they are always uh, expressed in worlds, like the patients should be larger than 18 uh, years old and stuff. So uh, we streamline the selection process by uh, encoding at them as a pseudo, pseudo codes. Um, so now we are able to more systematically to implement different uh, inclusion exclusion rules. And here is the one example. Uh, so this is a clinical trial from BMS, uh, which tests on nivolumab and doxytaxel. And here is the results of the original trial, like original publication. So it's the survival curve and the hazard ratio is around 0 0.73. And uh, for the original trial, we cannot know what if we do not use any uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. Because well, once you have this clinical trial, you already um, have those se selection rules. So we simulate from the real world data. Here is the number of patients. So you can just put in to say the first row is if you do not apply any inclusion exclusion criteria, and then you have. Um, 4,700 patients, but if you apply the rules or apply the criteria, you're only left with uh, around 1,000 patients. So you actually filter a lot of patients, like those patients are not el eligible for your trial. And also for this, um, the simulation uh, of the trial, this is the survival curve uh, we get. Uh, using the inclusion exclusion criteria and the hazard ratio, like very close to the original trial. But uh, now we are also able to say, what if we do not use any rule? Like say we do not use any criteria, we do not filter out any patients. So this is all the patients who are eligible, like the near 5K patients. We can, it's, it's very uh, straightforward. You can see the survival curve is almost stay the same. And the hazard ratio is also stay um, like the at the same level. So that means actually most your rules are not necessary for your uh, performance of the drug. So so the ideal way is to say yeah we can just do not use those rules. Then we can you can have near five k patients instead of one k patients, but also have this um, similar treatment effects. And we did more analysis. Um, so this is uh, to say, uh, what if, uh, so for this particular trial, we have 20 rules in total. What if we just select a subset? We just have like a, a small subset of a rule. So what, what will happen? Um, so in the graph here, each dot uh, indicates uh, one subset of rules. Uh, and you can see on the left graph, the x-axis is the number of select patients so uh, the ideally you want you want like uh, as more patients as possible and the y-axis is the hazard ratio so the ideally you want uh, as smaller hazard ratio as possible so what you really want is more patients and smaller hazard ratio so that is like a trade-off between those two uh, so that is what we mean by optimization so we, we can find a good subset where you enroll enough patients, but have the best hazard ratio reported. So on the right is a confidence interval. Um, for sake of time, we can just skip that. So we have more analysis. 
uh, for the influence of individual rules. So we'll develop some, um, uh, okay, we, uh, or we can uh, I'll give more explanations about this. So for example, uh, just, uh, just to remind you, so each dot is a subset of rules you have. So um, for example, you can see like uh, different clusters here. Um, for example, the difference between cluster one at the bottom corner. So that is, so that cluster has the best hazard ratio, which is um, like the best treatment effects you want. And the difference between the cluster one and cluster two is only whether they include um, a rule called ACOG. So the ACOG is basically, um, in the original trial, um, they have this criteria, they only include patients whose ACOG value is less or equal to one. So basically they only want to include very health, pretty healthy people. So, but it actually, um, tells you that if you include this um, rule, it actually does worse. You actually do not really want to include this rule. So that means this rule is pretty bad. So it's, uh, when you have this rule, you have less patients and also your treatment effect is worse. So we can uh, do this for, we can analyze this for uh, each uh, clusters. And we can also do this more systematically. So we also analyze the influence of each uh, rule. So um, in more specific, we use the Shapley value of each rule, which is uh, a metric to tell you the influence of each rule. Say, what if you include that rule, uh, how much uh, the hazard ratio would change so basically, here we just report uh, the most significant ones. So the, in the greens are the good ones, which, which means if you include that rule, your treatment effect would be better, like you will have lower hazard ratio, although you will have smaller patient, fewer patients. So for example, it's good to uh, have a rule about white block cell count, and also it's better to only look at people in the with a non squamous um, histology and also some um, uh, mutation or and uh, or it's also good to in, uh, look at patients um, or include patients which are on the specific stages and also those are in accordance with our intuitive analysis in the last slide and in reality, when you want to use this, you can just discard all the bad ones because for the bad ones, they lower your treatment effect. They, uh, they make your hazard ratio to be larger and also they include less patients. Uh, so, and whether to include those green ones, it depends on your evaluation. If your evaluation is, I want as more patients as possible, um, then you can, you can just uh, discard them because uh, um, like, uh, their contribution is not so significant. But if you really want the best hazard ratio, you can just include all the green ones. And we, uh, so that is one example uh, for uh, one BMS uh, clinical trial. So from that we have like a short conclusion is actually most uh, criteria are not so necessary. We do not really need them, and they um, like have will have like much smaller patients get included, while the hazard ratio does not improve so much. So we we did the similar studies for more trials for non-small cell lung cancer. So here we have drugs from different companies and also different drug types. Uh, here are uh, the reports of five different trials uh, where we report the number of inclusion exclusion rules. So you can see like for each trial, there are around 20 rules. So there are a lot of cohort selection rules. And we report the performance of before cohort selection. It means we just do not use any rules defined in the trial. And the after cohort selection means we did the similar thing as the trials, we use all the rules there. 
So, so there are two, uh, two uh, like, yeah, you, you can see here, like the patient's number always greatly are reduced. Uh, or, uh, almost only left with a third. Uh, that says the common ratio. And also the hazard ratio almost um, always remains at the same level. So all, all those trials have the common the similar message, which is um, actually most rules used in clinical trials are not so necessary. And you actually reduce a lot of patients and also the treatment effects is not uh, improved. Yeah, and when there are more interesting studies we can do. For example, um, different companies, they usually have different rules like um, from the intuition from their clinicians. So we can analyze the cross use of criteria. Say what if uh, I use the criteria from company one uh, at the trial from company B. So um, yeah, so those are uh, further uh, analysis. Um, so yeah, so just uh, in, uh, just to conclude our presentation is um, our work is to do the uh, optimization for the clinical trials where we, we show that most rules actually used in clinical trials are not so necessary and we can give further recommendations for example like what rules are very important in general you can include that what rules are pretty uh, like useless you can just discard that um, yeah uh, so I th that's uh, most of our presentation. Um, if people have any question, yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this. But in terms of the data set which you mentioned right in the beginning that is simulated the data going to the scarcity of data, could you please elaborate on that and on how you simulated the EMR records? Uh, yes. Um, so basically, say uh, in reality, the clinical trial is I have an experiment arm and a control arm. I want to test the performance of one drug. So how we simulate is in the real world data sets, we have patients who take different kinds of drugs. And we then, for example, in the clinical trial, we have drug A. And to simulate, we only look at patients who took drug A um, at specific Lime. So, so that we just think those patients as our, um, our uh, like the targets uh, for the trials. So that's how we simulate the clinical trial. Uh, and, uh, and also we have the records of the patients say, um, after they take this drug, their death records and also their lab uh, results we will have that so we just use those records as 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 the fake or as uh, as a simulation of the clinical trial yeah just a comment I think it would be also really interesting to see uh, you mentioned this a little bit at the end where you're comparing and this is very early research where you're comparing um, uh, the rules for one drug on a trial for another drug and I think that's potentially a, a really a value where maybe you can learn the, the rules of a drug and then you're you're testing out um, a generic or a very related drug to it and looking at or future efficacy and, and if you can use the, the historical information to then you know look at the yes. future drugs I think that that's really really promising yes yes yeah. that's a very good comment like we also plan to to like the follow-up about that. Yeah. Great. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs>